Hey, welcome back to the Group Project Podcast. This is episode number 57. Hey, I'm here today. We're going to talk about seven ideas to prevent teacher burnout. It's uh, based on a blog post I just uh, released, uh, I guess it was yesterday, and it's gotten a lot of good feedback and a lot of people saying it's resonating with them. So we're going to go ahead and let's dig into that a little bit. Maybe let's explain a little bit more than we could in the uh, in the actual post. Um, hopefully you uh, had a chance to look, listen to our episode this week. We had Andrew Murata. Um, talk, uh, he's a high school principal. He's an author. He's a speaker. Uh, he talked about surviving and thriving. It was a great episode. He brings so much energy. Um, we talk about broken windows theory, buy-in versus ownership. He was a he was a college basketball referee. Had some awesome stories, doing some great things out there in uh, in New York. Um, before we get started here, I always uh, like to explain the show a little bit. Um, this is a sh- educational leadership podcast. Uh, there's a lot of educational leadership podcasts out there, um, but what makes this one different? Um, well, we we talk about leadership. We talk about education and we also talk about personal growth and um, just some tips and tricks and ideas and and some guests who can help you uh, grow personally as well as professionally. I am excited for some of the future guests we have lined up. Uh, We got some real unique topics that are going to be discovered that will help you become a better educational leader and also to be better to grow yourself personally as well. Um, we'll, I'm sure we'll be highlighting and we'll be uh, discussing those future guests uh, here here soon. So let's jump into it here. Um, no guest today, just me. Uh, again, going to just talk a little bit about um, seven ideas around to preventing teacher burnout, because it seems like teacher burnout is a huge issue. And when I say teacher in this episode, I'm really talking about educators in general. So we're going to talk about educational leaders. We're going to talk about teachers. We're going to talk about, um, we're going to talk about support staff, basically anybody, um, who works in the field of education, um, could not only be helped by these tips, but also there's a pretty good chance if they don't get helped, they're going to be feeling the burnout as well. So, um, Again, if, if you want to read the, the blog entry, it's called Addressing Workaholiz- Workaholism, kind of hard to say, Addressing Workaholism in Schools. So if that helps out, if you're listening and you want to go Google search that or go to my website, it's the top blog at the top. Like I said, put that on social media, put that on Facebook, put that on Twitter and got a lot, a lot, a lot of reaction, which tells me we're on to something here. It's, it's uh, resonating with people out there. So I figured let's talk about it for a few minutes here. So in schools and in work in general, I feel like there's a, per, there's a perception out there that the more hours employees work, the better they are at their job. Okay. So there's, and I think education as much as anywhere, there's this thought about the more hours I put in, then I must be better at my job and I must care more. And I must, um, I must just really, you know, be more dedicated to the district. So, uh, you know, I, I, I mentioned, see if you've heard these before. So, you know, administrators, uh, who are worked long at who administrators who work long hours are hailed as dedicated to their job. Teachers who never leave school are praised for their commitment to kids. Staff who work through lunch, and I see it all the time. Uh, staff who work through lunch are commended for their tireless work ethic. So as you're listening to this, or if you're watching on YouTube, um, I guess just think, do you hear those things in your district, in your positions? Do you hear people say those? But you know what? What I what we what we know is, is educational norms, right? There's these educational norms and values that have been established over many years. And they really don't help us out. They don't help us in terms of fighting uh, workaholism in schools. You know, school boards, I've got my my yearly evaluation with a school board tomorrow night. And, um, you know, a lot of times school boards expect administrators and superintendents to be visible at every evening event. Administrators 
Okay. Expect teachers to grade work outside of contract hours. Athletic directors, okay, just had a meeting with our athletic directors last week, and we didn't talk about this, but a lot of athletic directors, they've got these activity passes, right? Activity passes are what helps staff and students and families, but staff we're talking about here, get into sporting events. And a lot of times athletic directors will say, um, well, staff can get an activity pass if they volunteer at so many events, if they volunteer at four evening events, I'm just making that up, then they can get that free activity pass. So educational norms like have kind of established this, you will work beyond these extra hours norms. The funny thing is, is that many educators, and you might be one of them, um, ironically kind of enjoy the workaholic title and you probably have some of these people in your building. Every, no, I'm gonna take that back. Every building, every district has these, the people who enjoy the workaholic title. Tell me if you've heard these before. In meetings, educators, I'm sorry, administrators argue over who has the busier nighttime schedule. I'm, I've got three nights this week that I've got to be at school. Oh yeah. I've got four nights this week. It's like, they, they want you to make feel, they want you to feel bad for them, but yet there's this little bit uh, that they're bragging about those number of nights. What about in faculty lounges, teachers debate who spends more hours grading papers. I spent three hours this weekend grading papers. Oh yeah. I spent four hours this weekend grading papers and then good old social media, right? On social media. Um, and again, I, I'm, I'm not saying I'm, I'm definitely not innocent on all of these things because I've been in these conversations and I've said some of these things, but over on social media, you know, you'll get your staff who 10 o'clock, 11 at night, uh, maybe it's midnight. We'll say, Oh, just finished work. So exhausted. Just finished conference, leaving conferences, you know, and, and clearly it's, it's very late at night. And, um, you know, it's kind of like feel bad for me yet. I'm excited to see who likes my posts and who comments on my posts. So, you know, we've got this really backwards way of thinking in schools and it's not just schools. It's, it's a lot of work in general. I can't say I've worked in other sectors, but, um, but it's just kind of, there's this, there's this badge of honor that people have about who works more often or who works longer hours. So here's the question. I researched this, uh, but the question is, does working more hours result in greater productivity? According to the CDC, people who routinely work extended and overtime hours are less productive than those who work 40 hour work weeks. So when I originally wrote that, I'm like, okay, that's great. You know, that's good. It's good evidence. But then I started thinking like educators are going to look at that and laugh because 40 hour work weeks, what's that? <laughs> try 50 hour week work weeks, try 55 hour work weeks, try 60 hour work weeks. A lot of people say there's no way they work 40 hour work weeks. So what about 50 hour work weeks, which is right around where most educators say they work. <laughs> and actually efficiency worsens. Employees who work 50 hours only produce about 37 hours of useful work. At 55 hours, those numbers drop to almost 30 hours of productivity. So there's this inverse correlation between number of hours work and actually the actual number hours of productivity. And that looks a little bit different in schools because how do you measure productivity when you're un, in front of kids? But uh, it could be teacher effectiveness goes down as the number of hours go up throughout the course of the week. So there's the there's kind of just the um, I guess the the baseline or the the start of, of the conversation. Really, what does that mean for educational leaders? Well, educational leaders. Some of you may be saying, well, yeah, we don't, I don't, I don't do anything extra. I don't, I don't make our staff. I'm very good about letting them go after eight hours, or I'm very conscientious and I don't send emails at all hours of the night, which is great. If you are, um, if you're not um, adding to that culture, 
that's a good first step. But what I believe and what I've seen from the best leaders is that instead of just maintaining the status quo, leaders actually have to take steps to push against and take actual intentional steps. And we're going to talk about seven to push back. Because if you're just maintaining, you're not doing any extra, you're not saying, hey, we got extra work or making people feel bad for um, not putting or, you know, only only working 40 hours. You know, that's one step. But to really fight this decades and century, century longs uh, issue of workaholism and having this badge of honor that I will work more than the 40 hours. Um, if you're just maintaining, you're really not, you're, you're really not um, uh, breaking down those barriers and breaking down those norms. So, um, so here's seven steps. We're going to talk about seven steps and here's the first one. And here's like, in my mind, the, 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 uh, probably one, one of the most powerful things that you could do. And I think you could do all these things right away. You could tomorrow, you could wake up and say, okay, I'm going to do one of these things, or I'm going to do five of these things. And you're probably already doing some, but think about how can I be intentional in making sure the staff who I oversee and if you're, you know, if you're a principal versus a superintendent versus the lead teacher versus the department chair versus whatever it might be, it might look a little bit, little bit different. But with the people I can control and the people I oversee, how can I take intentional steps to make sure they that I'm not in, unintentionally adding to this uh, workaholic and this burnout status? So the first one is, you know, um, you know, a lot of which is back up just a second here, a large number of educators believe they need to be constantly attached to their phone, right? So a lot of it comes down to the phone, right? Because I've got mine right here. It's like literally like a foot from me. I'm probably not modeling good behavior here. But um, a lot of people feel like they've got to be attached to their phone at all times, in case something comes up at work. Um, you know, there will be emergencies that arise. There will be. However, almost every situation that you encounter in, in education can be dealt with the next day. You know, there will be those certain emergencies. Absolutely. However, 90, 95, 99% of the time, something comes to your attention and you kind of feel like it's an emergency or I've got to give this person a response or I've got to get back to them right away can almost always be taken care of the next day. So my first step um, or my first idea to preventing teacher burnout is this idea about just engaging in conversations about um communications expectations. So step one, engage in conversations about communication expectations. Okay, so what well, here's what I do with our district leadership team. And our district leadership team is made up of administrators and directors. Um, so it's about like 14 of us. And we sit down and we talk about what can we expect from all of us as me as their boss. And then the rest of them as a group, as a team, it's really a team here, but I'm the, I'm the one who oversees them. How can we define how we communicate with one another? And we talk about emailing, texting and calling. And what does all of those mean? And what, you know, the, each of those should um, kind of specify whether or not it's emergency or not. So here's what we developed. And we said, or here's the conversation that we had. And I would totally recommend that you with whoever you oversee, um, that you have this conversation. So you know, what so you build an idea of what can be expected with different types of communication. So we talk about email and we go around the group and we, we say like, what should be a, an expected turnaround time on an email? And though another way of thinking about it is if I send you an email, 
how long should it be until I hear back from you? And we said that we would expect a two day turnaround for, for emails. It doesn't mean a one day turnaround, doesn't mean a five hour turnaround. So I know if I send an email to somebody on our leadership team, I should hear back from them within two days. So that's certainly not an emergency, right? If I had an emergency, I would not be sending an email saying, please help ASAP. Um, so we, we discussed and we, we agreed that 48 hours should be that length of turnaround time. The second, okay, so we talked about email. What about texting? Because we text a lot. Now we don't use Slack. Some organizations use Slack. Um, the more, and I'll be honest, I don't know much about Slack. I've heard some people who love it. I've also heard about people who are saying it's probably more, um, probably um, uh, takes your attention more than it should and probably distracts you more than it should. I don't know. We text a lot. So maybe we're using texting in a way that Slack is, is meant to be used. But if we agree that if we send a text, to anyone in that group, whether it's a group text or an individual text, or if somebody texts me, that we need to respond that day. It means it's a little bit more important than an email, but it's not quite as important as a phone call. So if I text you and it's 9.30 a.m., you know, I am under the understanding, you know, they'll get back to me when they can. Hopefully it's not at 9 p.m. that night, but the person who receives that text should not feel any pressure to have to get back to write out immediately. Again, this should not be an emergency. Like I need a response ASAP. So email 48 hours text respond that day. The next level up probably where you're getting into more of those emergencies would be calling. Okay. And so when you call someone, if I see a call come across, I know, okay, something's pretty important. They need my attention right now. It's not, they're not sending me a text. They're not sending me a phone call. They're sending, I'm sorry, a, an email. They're making a phone call, which is like, oh, okay. They, they must need something. Now I, this is sounds crazy for a superintendent, but I have my cell phone on mute at all day, uh, at all times. Um, I check my phone enough. <laughs> I check it all the time, meaning I look at it all the time, knowing if I missed a phone call, usually I'm seeing it with, within five minutes. Um, but what that means is if you're, if you're um, and the reason I do no sound on my phone for anything, for anything is because I don't like that distraction. Um, I think it's a distraction to me. I think it's a distraction to others in, in my group. It's just a, it's a personal opinion. I haven't done sound for years. Um, but again, I check it enough. I look at it enough to make sure I don't miss anything important. So what we say with our team is if we leave a voicemail, that means like, listen to this email or this voicemail right now, check it out. Listen. And almost always, it means like, Hey, give me a call back. We've got something going down. If I get a phone call and I see there isn't a voicemail, I kind of know that, okay, it's, we got something going on here, but it's not an emergency. A lot of times um, they will maybe just send a follow-up text like, hey, I've got something brewing. Um, not a huge rush, but give me a call when you can. So we kind of differentiate a call with a voicemail, depending on what the voicemail says, it's probably a pretty good idea. I better call them back. ASAP. If it's a call without a voicemail and, um, but there's a follow-up text that probably says, Hey, call me. If there's a phone call and no voicemail and no follow-up text. Yeah. I kind of feel that one out. Sometimes I don't bother calling them back because I, because we have an understanding amongst our team is if you don't leave a voicemail and you don't leave a follow-up text, it's probably not that important. And they'll get a hold of me later. Um, so we've got those four different differentiations. Email, get back within two days. Text, get back that day. Phone call with a voicemail, it's probably an emergency. Call me back ASAP. Call with without a voicemail or without a, without a follow-up text. Eh, usually you know your people well enough to know kind of what's going on. Um, so there we, you know, and, and again, a lot of people are saying, 
well, yeah, we already kind of know those things. Like I, I kind of know those things. Kind of knowing these things is not good enough. You've got to have that conversation. I'm telling you, there are very few leaders who have this conversation with their team and say, here's how we operate and here's how we do business. Um, a lot of people might say, we don't have time to have that conversation. I don't think you have time not to have the conversation. I Meaning, I think you're going to lose time by having to um, navigate not knowing how you operate within those norms that you're going to waste way more time trying to backtrack and trying to figure out issues than you are if you would have that conversation. So we have that conversation. We revisit it every semester. We make sure we're on the same page. It really doesn't change, but we answer any questions and I get our team to recommit, re recommit to it uh, to make sure that they all agree. Now, the other thing you need to know is how this all comes in the teacher burnout or educational burnout is there's a little at the bottom of it. It says email rules do not apply to weekends. So meaning, you know, you, um, you know, if you get a call with a voicemail over the weekend, hopefully you don't too often. And I try very, I mean, I rarely do it. I mean, rarely uh, do it to anybody on our team. Um, you know, that would be an emergency, a text try not to do it. And we do a lot of fun text too. That's where this gets a little tricky. Like we're kind of an easygoing bunch and I've got different groups. Uh, I've got an office group, uh, uh, admin only group and admin and directors group. Uh, we do a lot of fun, like, Hey, you know, over the weekend, Hey, look at this, look at this meal I'm having, or look at this fun thing I'm doing. So that doesn't mean you need to reply to like a fun text. But for example, tonight, crazy. We might have some winter weather coming our way. It's supposed to snow a few inches. I will most likely send the group a text, getting their feedback on what tomorrow might look like if we have to delay school. And that, if I send that text, that means like, Hey, I'm in no huge rush, but I kind of like a response at some point tonight on, on what I need to think about if we do delay tomorrow. Not saying we're delaying anywhere, whoever's listening in our district. I'm just saying that's an example of, of where I would might send a text. But when it comes down to emails, uh, if I send you an email on Saturday morning, because, and all of us have different work schedules, and I don't care when you send emails. If you send them at midnight, or if you send them over the weekend, or if you send them at 4.30 in the morning, like I don't really care um, because I know I've got a couple of days to get back to you. And I know... If I get it over the weekend, I don't need to worry about it. I don't need to get, if I get it Friday night at 6 p.m., I'm not going to worry about it because you didn't text me or call me or raise that level of um, uh, awareness. I don't need to worry about it until Monday or even Tuesday because I know I've got that 48-hour turnaround time. So again, having that conversation with your group is, is huge. Um, one last thing, I know this is a super long first point about having these communications, expectations, conversations, um, and the other ones are going to go a lot faster, but it's such an important aspect and it's going to totally get your team on the same page. The reason that you do is not only because you give your, your staff, the people you oversee permission to, um, to relax on the weekends and at nights and disengage and don't worry about those emails and don't feel like you've got to respond right away. It's the other side of things. Some leaders are, are really bad at communicating. Unfortunately, been there, done that. You probably can think of some people too, meaning they are hard as heck to get a hold of. You try texting them and calling them and they might not call you back till the next day, even though you need an answer like ASAP. Um, there's just some, I, I, it's just unfortunate that some people rise the ranks in education and they're such bad communicators. It just baffles my mind. And hopefully you don't have too many of those people in your district, but I'm guessing you probably can think of one at least who is a terrible communicator and never gets back to people. By having that discussed, you can hold that person accountable to acting like that. And if they continue to, to break your group norms and that person needs to be dealt with. So that's number one. Okay, we're gonna go through the last six pretty quick here. 
Number two is honor the contract. Staff should not be given work that cannot be done during contracted hours. When school leaders implement new initiatives, they must allocate time for staff to complete work during contracted hours as opposed to assigning homework. So if you give staff something to do, you better give them the gift of time to complete that during the school day. They should not be expected to do um, new implementation work, whether whatever your implementation thing is, um, if it's PBIS or if it's some instructional framework, um, doesn't you know doesn't matter what it is. Like you shouldn't say, oh by the way, you're going to do that at night or you're going to do that on the weekends. You might be laughing at me saying we never do that, but there's too many districts who expect their staff to do those things. You need to build in time during the day. Number three is trade time. Okay, so this comes up a lot in offices with secretaries. If you're in a district leadership office, you have, you work with a lot of people who are outside the classroom. Sometimes you have projects that come up um, that make that person put in extra time. Prime example here in my office is my secretary, Jess, who is awesome. I love working with her. We've got contracts for teachers going out tomorrow, March 15th, the first day that contracts can go out. We get them out that first day because we want to know who's coming back for next year. And um, she's been working really, really hard, as has another secretary um, who, uh, um, who is also... Uh, working on contracts to make sure we get the, I forgot her name, Leslie. <laughs> Leslie and Jess are both working on contracts. Jess has got the teaching staff. Uh, Leslie's got the support staff. They're getting those contracts out tomorrow. And um, they've been working extra hours to get those out. And, you know, what I, what you got, what you should do is, hey, as a leader, go up to them and say, hey, I noticed you've been working extra hours beyond your normal time to get this done. Not only do I appreciate that, and not only are you awesome at your job, I also know that you've accumulated like four extra hours that are beyond your contract. I want you to find a time to take those four hours off. And, and sometimes they might say, no, no, I'm good. I'm good. It's just part of the job. But give them that option. Say like, hey, you could take this Friday afternoon off. I know your schedule for next Friday afternoon is light. Why don't you take those four hours off and, and use that trade time to make up for those hours that you spent doing those contracts? So leaders should always notice these occurrences and give staff the opportunity to leave work early or come in late to compensate for the additional effort. So that's number three, trade time. Number four, is eat lunch. I talked about this earlier. One of the most obvious badge of honor activities in education is skipping lunch. How many times do people say, no, I don't need lunch. I'm going to work or, I'm, or they eat it like five minutes at their desk as they're working on something. Secretaries are, you do this all the time um, where they don't take their, they don't take their lunch and they say, I'm good. I'm good. I got too much work to do. And that's sometimes hard to get over. And sometimes you can only tell them so many times, like, hey, you can take your time. You don't, you know, don't, if you want to eat through, if you don't want to take lunch, that's great. You can only tell them so many times, right? But here's what they need to know is I know it's hard to measure productivity, but there's a lot of research that says if you take that 30 minutes and decompress and disconnect and go somewhere and just do something different and get your mind off work, you're going to be that much more effective in the afternoon. Your productivity is just going to skyrocket in the afternoon, which will more than make up for those 30 minutes that you didn't give up because you ate, you gave up your lunch or you ate uh, at your desk. So even if you feel like I'm saving time by not eating and by working, there's a lot of research that says in the afternoon, you're going to be so worn down and so burnt out that your productivity level is not going to match uh, actually taking that lunch. So number four is making sure that staff know it's okay to take lunch. 
We want you to take lunch. Take as much time as you want because you're going to be more effective in the afternoon when you're well rested. I know taking more than 30 minutes for staff, for teaching staff doesn't always work or support staff in the buildings because you only have, according to, you know, students are going to be coming back to the classroom. That's fine. Make sure you keep that 30 minutes sacred and give them every chance. Cause a lot of schools will say we give 30 minutes, but then they've got, you know, they've got to supervise kids during that time, or they've got to do, they got to walk kids to lunch and walk them back. Give your staff that 30 minutes and let them take that time to eat, decompress and disconnect. And when there's other times when kids aren't in the building, which isn't a whole lot, but there's like 10 days throughout the year where there's no kids around and you get to be flexible. We give our staff not a 30 minute lunch, not a 60 minute lunch. We give our staff a 90 minute lunch every single time um, there are no kids in the building um, because we feel like we need to make up for all those rushed and hurried lunches of the other days. We're going to give you plenty of time to go out to eat with your, with your colleagues, go home, let the dog out, rest up, whatever you need to do. We're going to give you 90 minutes on those days. We don't have kids for your lunch. So that's number four. Number five is use your days. Okay, school leaders, we have a habit of making staff feel bad <laughs> for taking, uh, and this is uh, when, when staff are asking about using days. We're going to talk about leaders using days in a minute. But when, when staff ask to use days, a lot of times the default reaction from leaders is to think about, all the bad things they think about, Oh no, we've got to find a sub. Oh no, we're going to have a, our kids are going to be rowdy that day. Oh no. How are you going to make up this work? That's their default setting. So, so staff are always nervous to ask their bosses um, for that time off or to tell them they're going to take off because they don't want to see that reaction because they get that reaction from their leader, which is, Oh gosh, look at all the ways it's going to hurt our, our school. Instead, bosses, uh, leaders, your default setting needs to be awesome. I'm glad you're taking that time off. What are you going to do with that time? Showing excitement when that person or those people ask for that time off. So again, immediate flip your mindset, even though deep down inside, you might be like, oh gosh, what are we going to do without them here? Do not show that outwardly. Instead, outwardly show your staff that you're excited, that, you know, maybe they want to share what they're doing. Maybe they're going on vacation. Great. Tell me about it. Oh, you're going to take a three-day weekend. Oh, you're going to go out of town. Great. Tell me about it. Excite. Good. You're going to get rested up. You're going to enjoy it. And you're going to come back the following week that much more rested and that much more excited to be working in our organization. One, two, three, four, five. Number six. Okay. Here's where we're going to flip it around. Leaders become, and this one's called modeling, right? So if we say, hey, make sure that we tell people, take your days, we got to model that as well. Meaning leaders become their own worst enemies when they encourage staff to take time, but never leave work themselves. So again, this is kind of one of those badge of honor things you hear all the time. A lot of leaders will say, well, I never use my personal days. I never use my vacation. Um, as if it's this huge badge of honor, as if I am so dedicated to my job, I just give back that I don't even care if I lose them. I'm just so busy. That doesn't send a good message to your staff that you will never leave. If you're encouraging them to take their days off, which I hope that's the first step, but then you never take those days off yourself, you're sending the wrong message. Whether or not you like it, like it or not, um, you're probably, you know, people are watching like, gosh, my boss never takes time off, whether it's for vacation or if it's like if they're sick, <laughs> which is another thing. Um, but, you know, if you really feel compelled to work and I'm one of those people who always feels compelled to work and you probably do, too. I feel inadequate if I'm not working at a high level and helping people and helping the district move forward. You know, you could still take your days and you can still go on vacation 
And you can still do work remotely. I mean, everybody is doing remote work these days, right? So even if you choose not to come in the office, but you still feel like you've got to check your email and you've got to work and you've got to communicate, like you can do that away from the office and you can do those elsewhere. So you're still modeling taking those days. Um, so that would be the number six is just is making sure that you um, that you're modeling taking those days for your staff and, and you're not afraid to tell people, yes, I'm going to go out of town for a couple of days. Now you might not, you know, there are some bosses who get really annoying because they always talk, you know, because they always talk about I'm flying here. I'm, I'm going on this to this resort. I'm going, you know, you got to be careful about um, perception of bosses always spending a lot of money. I'm going down a whole different rabbit hole here, but be careful about that because there are some leaders who um, just are not tactful and will always, whether or not they're trying to or not, they'll brag about where all these exotic locations are going. Be careful with that. However, do not be afraid to tell people, you know what, I'm taking this day. I'm going to take this day and I'm going to, for example, last week, I went and saw my parents for a day. Uh, they only live an hour away, but I spent half the day with my dad, half the day with my mom. And it was a good day. It was a great day. And I told our team here and the, the team I oversee in the buildings that I'm going to take this day. It's a vacation day. I'm just going to go see my parents. And if you need me, give me a text, give me a call. I, you know, we, the same rules apply that I talked about earlier. If an emergency call comes up, call me because I'm going to get back to you right away, but do not be afraid about taking those days. That's number six. And number seven is be careful. Management should be weary of attendance incentives. Although staff attendance and sub shortages are a major concern in many districts, placing too much emphasis on absenteeism will result in staff feeling like they can't miss any time. A lot of districts will have these, um, these um, contests or incentives for not missing any school or any work, I should say. Um, not that that's a bad thing and I could see both ways on this, but you've got to be really be careful. Again, I would, there's a lot of things you can reward staff on and there's nothing wrong with maybe doing an in-person. Hey, I've noticed you are never gone. It's amazing. Thank you so much for your hard work and commitment. I would be leery about doing that in per, in a large group setting because you could be setting, you could be mixing signals about trying to avoid teacher burnout, but also telling your staff, well, if you're never gone, you're going to get this award. So just be careful about those types of attendance instead of programs. So there's the seven. The one is having that communications conversation with your team. Number two is, um, is uh, honoring the contract and not giving work outside contract hours. Number three is trade time, offering trade time to staff who work extra hours on projects. Number four is making sure people know they can eat lunch, <laughs> protect that time. Number five is encouraging people, um, not discouraging people to take time. And when they come to you, being excited for them. Number six is as leaders, making sure you take those days. And number seven is be careful with attendance incentives and maybe award those people maybe in smaller uh, individualized settings as opposed to um, large group settings. Uh, okay, I'm going to finish up with this real quick and then I will get you out of here. But you may be wondering, you know, what if I enjoy work and I love working extra hours? And I kind of mentioned this earlier. I do too. You know, I, I am the type that puts in a lot more hours um, because I love it and I feel like, uh, it makes, you know, I, I feel better about myself and it motivates me and, um, you know, and it gives me great satisfaction. So, you know, if people do the, if people work extra hours and they show if they're high performers and they show no signs of, of, uh, burnout, then I don't think you stop them. I, I, you know, I think it's annoying when somebody says, well, you work too many hours. Yeah, but I'm doing, I'm working at a pretty high level and I get a lot of stuff done. So I don't, you know, you shouldn't make, they, you shouldn't have to feel bad about that. So there's nothing wrong with letting those employees work at those, work those hours. And if you see somebody, 
is still great. You know, they're not getting burnt out and they're, um, they still have that perfect work life balance by all means, like just let them do their thing. That's great. You know, that's great. If you got somebody who's that motivated, however, be very careful because there are some people who can fool you. And I identify four people, four types of people who say, Oh, I love putting in extra work. You know, it's, I, I feel really motivated by it. And I just, I just love being at work all the time. However, they might contradict those things with the way they act or the, or the things they say. So look out for these four types of employees. The first we call the show off. These employees love to brag about the hours they work. Um, they constantly remind coworkers in person and on social media about how many hours they complete. So you can say that you love putting in extra hours, but be careful about not showing off and about making others feel bad because those people will just add to the workaholism culture in your school. That's the first one. The second type of employee who tricks you into thinking they love all the extra hours is the complainer. These workers say they love putting extra work, but then manage to find ways to complain about how much is on their plate plate. You can't have it both ways. You can't say, I love, I love, or I love putting in extra work. And then you complain about it. You just can't, you can't have it both ways. So those people do, you know, you got to deal with them. Number three is the loafer. These people never leave work. These people also never get anything done. They might not show off or complain, but their productivity levels do not match their hours worked. So think about your workplace. You might have somebody who's at work all the time and you kind of ask your colleagues, like, what do they do with all their hours? Like they're there all the time. They never leave, but I don't know what they're producing. Like, what are they doing? <laughs> Cause they're probably a low performer. So again, loafers need to be stopped because they are setting a bad example for the rest of their colleagues. Uh, and they're making the others feel bad. Number four, we call the avoider. These staff say they love putting in extra hours of work, but they don't appear happy or healthy. A lot of times avoiders kill time at work, probably cut because they're avoiding issues at home. Every job I've been in, there is somebody who always sticks around at work, never leaves because we later find out that there's issues at home, whether it's a bad marriage or issues with their kids or whatever it is. Um, so they will, they will just kill time at work to, to avoid going home. So with all four of those people, the show off, the complainer, the loafer, the avoider, you know, it's hard sometimes to address those people, but if you don't, there's a good chance that they are adding to your workaholic culture in your district or in your building. So you need to think, you know, if I'm really going to make people feel good about only working 40 hours, then I really probably need to address those people who are not high performers, who are putting in lots of extra hours, and they're probably unknowingly or maybe knowingly adding to your burnout culture. So again, here's the key point here is that you here there, there were, we talked about seven steps for addressing that that uh, teacher burnout or the education educator burnout, right? Simply sitting back and not you know not putting extra on people, you know, not expecting people to work outside those those uh, contracted hours, simply sitting back and not doing anything. It's just not good enough anymore. You've got to be proactive and make sure your employees and make sure that your organization understands that teaching is already hard enough during the day. Kids, I mean, working with kids, difficult kids and difficult parents and college, you know, teaching and education is very difficult. Like you need to be able to leave your work at work and be able to rest up at home on, at night and on the weekends. Um, so leaders, um, and I'll just leave, I'll leave you off here with what I wrote, which is leaders who understand the correlation between staff well-being and job performance must, 
must consistently remind employees that it's okay to disconnect from work. When school leaders regularly communicate the dangers of burnout and give, give staff permission to maintain a healthy work-life balance, employees will feel empowered to reject the workaholic badge of honor. So I, again, I'm going to encourage you. I, I hope you enjoyed kind of just me going through some of those things. Um, very few from what I've seen, very few districts will actually, will actually take all those steps um, to make sure that their staff are, are uh, have permission to disconnect. So I encourage you to go and um, go and implement those ideas. Again, it's all written in that blog called Addressing Workaholism in Schools. Uh, and it's on my website uh, and uh, check it out. So again, I hope you enjoyed episode number 57, seven ideas to prevent teacher burnout. Um, if you have any thoughts, ideas, comments, I would love for you to share them with me. And as always, uh, I really have been enjoying those five-star reviews and reading uh, the comments that you leave. If you enjoyed this episode, there's nothing more motivating than uh, opening up my Apple podcasts and scrolling to the bottom where I see reviews and getting a brand new five-star review with a comment about how impactful this is. So if you like this episode, I just really encourage you to scroll down and make sure that you leave that review. Uh, also, just make sure you press that subscribe button if you like this. If you like this episode and this is your first time listening, subscribe. Uh, we are on all the major podcast providers. I personally love Spotify as well, and there's a way to um, follow the episodes over on Spotify. So make sure you press that button. So, again, this is Jared Smith. Uh, seven ideas to prevent teacher burnout. This is the group project podcast, episode 57, where we cover leadership, education, and personal growth every week. That's it for today. Have a great day and we'll see you next week.